Welcome, <laughs> laughing as I start the video. Welcome back to my booktube channel. I just checked. So hello to my seven subscribers. I can no longer say my little two subscribers. I can no longer say that. I'm I'm happy but also sad because that was like my thing for like a couple videos. My two subscribers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to my subscribers. Thank you for leaving comments. I have seen more comments. I think I've seen one or two likes here and there. Um, <laughs> thank you for the interaction. Thank you for the response. That's what I want. It's not, I'm not here to become the next, you know, big thing. I'm here to talk about books. And a lot of y'all are neglecting. I have this video. I guess I'll link it. Um, Bookstagram versus Goodreads. I want to make one books to Graham versus YouTube, but it's like many, I don't know. I don't know because I get, like I said, a lot more people comment. I get more messages. I get more likes on, on books to Graham and there's challenges and stuff. There's challenges and stuff on booktube too. So I don't know. I need to, maybe if I did some of the tags, maybe I'll do a tag. I'm sure there's an autumn tag that I'm not paying attention to on booktube that I need to get in on it. Anyway, I also have an autumnal haul. I'll, I'll link a lot of stuff below because I think some of my new subscribers, you know, you missed some good stuff in the beginning. Maybe you haven't seen it. Maybe you haven't been suggested it yet. <laughs> anyway, that's not the point. I do want to know what y'all's opinion about Goodreads versus Bookstagram, but we'll get, that's, that's literally another video. Anyway, this video at 1 minute and 45 seconds, I don't think that's that bad. Some YouTubers talk for like five minutes before they get to the topic. So I'm getting to the topic. The topic is going to be The Haunting of Bly Manor on Netflix. <laughs> the time pointing at the title. The Haunting of Bly Manor on Netflix. So this is a booktube channel, but I like, I'm going to talk about all kinds of pop culture and stuff because I do. I like, I like everything going on. Um, <sighs> the Haunting of Bly Manor. I've said it five times. Let's see if I start talking about it soon. I don't have my note. I don't, I didn't take notes on my little notebook while I was watching like the last two and a half episodes. We will get into it. When I was watching, I was starting to take some like notes for this video. Um, but this is an adaptation, so it is related to books. It's an adaptation of the novel Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Someone said their favorite, one of their favorite authors was Henry James. I was like, I literally only read Turn of the Screw and Daisy Miller for school. I read Turn of the Screw just for myself because I was like, ooh, spooky. It's a classic, you know, classic era, spooky Let's see what this is about. So let's just start with my opinion on the novel. So it's, this is booktube. Y'all know, know me from booktube or bookstagram or whatever. So <laughs> the novel is boring. I mean, it's very short. Some people call it a novella. It's like 200 pages or less. It's like, two, I think it's like 210 pages or something like that, which I think is interesting that people are like, that's not a real novel, but like 310 pages, that's a novel. I don't know. <laughs> it's a novella. <laughs> anyway. It was boring. It was boring. It was short. You know something is boring when it's short. It doesn't last that long, but you're still bored. Like, I haven't been here that long, but I'm still bored. <laughs> like, that's the novel was boring. And I think, like, it's hard for me to get super spooked out from books in general. So maybe that's part of it, because I do like scary movies. I'm very easily scared by scary movies. But, like, books that are spooky, I'm like, eh. You know, like, I think I'm more horrified by books. Does that make sense? Like, I think I'm more, like, like shook and shocked by, like, plot points and books and twists and things like that. Is my tooth okay? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, like, for uh, books, I, I'm just not, like, the spooky, creepy. It doesn't give me as much. It doesn't give me as much. I have not... The last time I felt physically uncomfortable reading something that wasn't, like, horror, I don't know, that's debatable. It was probably, like, the yellow wallpaper. I read that in the middle of the night. I was, like, finishing all of my homework, and it's a short story. So I was, like, finishing all, it was college. I was finishing all my homework, and I was reading it, and I got to this point where I was like, oh, it's, like, 1030. Let me hurry up and read this, and then go to bed, and I'll be ready. I'll, I'm done. I was, I was a good student. 
<laughs> so I was like, I did all my homework. Let me read the story real quick. It was like 10, 30, 11 ish. I was like, girl, this is creepy. It was creepy, but it was also like, I was also having some like, it was my first semester of college. I was also having some of that little anxiety. And we had just gone to see Paranormal Activity 3, 2 or 3. Two or three. What I think it was two. No, I think it was two because the third one is in an apartment complex. The second one is with the two little girls in the big house in the suburbs. Anyway, I'm like so off on a tangent. Okay. Hopefully y'all will be enjoying my tangents like Peter Mon. Hopefully. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so the novel, eh, the novel wasn't great. It was kind of boring. And here's another point that I want to mention about the novel. It was widely kind of believed. So the basic premise is woman goes to a big scary house to be an au pair for two little kids. Um, spooky stuff happens. The ghosts are interacting with the kids. The cook and everybody's like, the kids will creep you. Watch out for the kids. You know, like, <laughs> that's my Grace Randolph voice. <laughs> If you watch her, then you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> watch out for the kids. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> that's basically the whole book. That's basically the whole novel is that. And then it like ends and she like leaves. I mean, there's a there's like a confrontation, spoiler alert, around the lake and all that kind of stuff. And things are, that's a mild spoiler in my opinion. Oh, well, let's, and speaking of spoilers, I do have to say that this is going to be a spoiler re review. Like, this is going to be full of spoilers. I don't know. I just can't talk about it in any other way. It's a spoiler review. I have to because it's. But if you want to just stop here and know what my recommendation is, do I recommend you watching it? I recommend you mm, checking it out. I, rec I recommend you trying the first two episodes. If you already have Netflix, it's not something like to make you go subscribe. But I do think, like, if you have it, I'd say check out the first two episodes. I thought the first, like, three or four episodes were really good, and I was really into it. Um, then we get to a turning point where I'm like, no, no, sweetie. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> okay. So let's get into it. Okay, creepy energy. Okay. I mentioned that it was like a metaphor. Did I mention it was a metaphor for a lot of people interpreted because the ghosts interact with the kids a lot. People thought that there was a metaphor for basically molestation. Oh my gosh. I'm going to get demonetized. Just kidding. I don't, I don't get that. But like, it was like, people thought that like, because, because it's like the ghosts are particularly looking for the kids. I mean, she, the au pair in the novel sees the ghosts sometimes with their kids. They're looking for the kids and looking to interact with the kids. Anyway, um, but let's talk about the adaptation. The adaptation was, it started off strong in my opinion, because like I said, I said here in my little notes, let me see, let me show you my notes. Oh, you can't see it. You can't, oh, like that. You can see. That's, <laughs> my note says the creeping imagery is better on screen, on screen than on the, on the page. And I agree with that. There's this, um, imagery. I think they use the plot of the book really well. I think they use the setting really well. And I think that they use the imagery really well. So I think it is a true adaptation. It does truly take a lot from the book. It's not like when some people are writing a story that's completely different and then all of a sudden it's just names, the same character names. No, it's really, it's really, they take a lot from the book thematically, uh, atmospherically, the imagery wise. So there is this imagery and I, I don't think this is a spoiler. I think, no, it's like a basic prem. It's a basic image in the novel and the show. Oh, my alarm. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm not editing that. I'm moving on. So <laughs> there's like, I'm sitting next to a window. There's like so many moments where the guy, Miles, who's the driver, comes up to the window and his face is like, he does this in the book and in the show, but in the show, it's scary and jarring. It's like, ooh, a creepy man is peeking through my window. I'm not here for it. Um, so he's just like, <laughs> at the window, and you're just like, and the, 
<laughs> the au pair is like, ah! I see the guy. It's the guy who's the driver who ran away with the money. And they're like, are you sure you saw him? Are you sure? And they're like, yes, I saw him. And they're like, well, because they don't know he's dead. So I felt like that was effective because I did think that was creepy. What else did I think was effective? I thought certain times, okay, they had some, they had some cheesy things like stereotypes throughout, like walking around slowly through the dark at night. You know, they, they did that several times. And I know that they do that in horror movies and stuff, but it's like very cliche at this point. They did that several times. One time when it was effective was they were playing hide and seek. And Flora was in a, uh, she was in the attic, not the basement, the attic. I don't think they had a basement. She was in the attic and she was, the music box was playing. I was like, da, 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 whatever the song is. And it was like this weird ghosty thing behind her was like, ah. oh, this is definitely a spoiler, but I don't care. I'm telling you anyway. This is... <laughs> I thought that was really effective. I thought that was really good. Um, <laughs> I felt like that ghost was creepy. I was like, and it happened like like that. I was like, who was that? What was that? And then you just see it. It was like blurry behind her. I was like, who was that? What was that? I don't know what that was that was happening. That was really good. But, and I have here written down um, ghost logic, question mark. <laughs> There was no ghost logic. And this is where I say it starts to fall apart. Because they did do, to me, a good adaptation brings a lot of the elements and themes out of the original work that it's, uh, that it's adapting. So I don't expect it to be so faithful all the time. Like, I think The Shining is a really good adaptation. But it's completely different than the book, really. A lot, a lot is different. But it's good. What they add is good. I'm like... <laughs> my hair um I keep touching it but this they added a lot so the thing the big thing okay I'm just gonna spoil it because it's not that good anyway it's not it's it, people have heard of it but it's not trending like that like it's not that popular so what they added was like half the people in the house are like walking around as ghosts so <laughs> so it was almost like it was like a shining moment with one of the characters named Hannah and it was this black lady with bald head if you see her she's not in any of the advertisements which I'm gonna get into that later but she and neither is the um first nanny Miss Jessel who is also very important to the plot but she um she's dead you know like <laughs> so Miles is dead which I already knew from reading the book that he was dead because you know, he's dead in the book. I mean, he's a ghost haunting. And he's creeping around. Like, I don't know if, if you didn't read the book, if you thought he may have been alive. Because he is just looks like a guy standing creepily in the window. He could have been there. But it's like, obviously, like, we're in a go we're in a haunting situation. Of course, the creepy guy that no one else has seen yet is not alive. So he's an obvious ghost. But this Hannah character, this is how they pull one over on you. Hannah is there. You notice that Hannah doesn't eat. Like, it's really obvious. She doesn't eat. When, when They're all getting around for breakfast. They're all drinking hot cocoa. They're all having a swig of gin. She doesn't eat or drink anything, okay? Meanwhile, everyone around her is talking to her. They can hear her. They can see her. She can hold things. She can talk to everyone. So the first couple episodes, everything, she's just another cast member. Then we get to episode five, and this is where it falls apart to me. Episode five, all of a sudden, she's a ghost. She's a ghost. She's dead, and she's a ghost because Miles killed her. And it's so convoluted. It's so convoluted. So Miles possesses the little boy, and he walks around and does things. Why? I don't understand why. Because... Hannah, and it's not consistent, and this is my problem with, like, magic and, like, ghosts and all this kind of stuff sometimes. Keep it simple, stupid. Like, I just, it's when it gets convoluted, that's when I check out. Because I'm like, this is inconsistent and weird and stupid. So he, he has to, for some reason, um, 
he can't touch anything. Like when he, he does the ghost thing where his hands goes, his hands go through things, you know, he can't hold anything, but miss Hannah can just walk around. She wears different clothes and outfits. And they said like, it's because she's dreaming and she doesn't want to accept that she's a ghost. So she can, if you just don't accept you're a ghost, you can just hang out and wear clothes, walk around. That doesn't make sense. I was like, really? Are you serious? Anyway, so this is what I'm saying. So my notes are like, she lives in her memories. That's why she, and they, they have this thing in the show called Tucked Away. It's like the most British thing ever. They're like, oh, I hate being tucked away. I don't want to be tucked away. I'm going to be, I'm going to tuck you away. And they keep saying this because it's like, there's like part of their ghost power is they can possess someone. And when they possess you, they send your consciousness back into your memories. So they're walking around in the day-to-day -day life and you are back in your memories being possessed. I don't, it's just so convoluted. Honestly, if like that was just it, I think that would have made more sense. There's just too much going on. So she, but she can't eat. So this is the next thing. So she can wear clothes. She can touch people. She can hold a mug. She can hold a fork, but she can't eat. Why can't she eat? Because eating is purely mechanical. She can do other things that are purely mechanical. I don't, it doesn't make sense. There's no logic. Then there's a curse that, okay. I took that note before we got to episode seven. Ugh, that's, um, oh, and then it's like the parents' ghosts, they're dead. So the parents are dead, but the parents' ghosts haunt the uncle, the, 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 well, the husband's ghost. His brother haunts him because he, he, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to say a bad word. He finagled his wife. So he's mad and he's coming back from the dead to haunt. Obviously ghosts. Okay. And this is another thing. So all the ghosts are metaphors. In the book, people thought that the ghosts were a metaphor for molesting children, which is creepy. And it's like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, but this story, it's like, I feel like the new thing, not high end, but like highbrow horror or highbrow suspense horror thriller movies their new thing is it's come becoming like it's becoming somewhat of a cliche within the genre that like to make it more thoughtful we're just gonna have the ghost be a metaphor for grief it's always it's always a metaphor for grief there's only a couple things that it means grief regret that's it grief regret that's all <clears throat> and so the ghosts hang around and haunt people and remind them of all their griefs and regrets so the brother is like oh i regret sleeping with my brother's wife <laughs> do you really do you really and then and then um oh this is a big problem a lot of the plot takes place in the past so they use this tucked away i'm tucked away in a memory they use this issue um to they use this to tell the story and we spend so much time back in the past in people's memories i'm just like it's it's not it's not it, it doesn't it doesn't work for me it's just it just takes you out of it because you literally especially in the episodes where we are dedicated to looking into one person's past it's just not it I feel like when you have a long series, and I think TV, sh TV shows and TV series have been doing this, where <clears throat> we have a long overarching plot, and good God, <laughs> it's on fire today. <clears throat> okay. We have a long overarching plot, but in this episode, we're just going to focus on this one character and dive into their backstory. That's cute on a big ensemble cast show. Something in the t something along the lines of like American Horror Story, when you're gonna have 12, 13 episodes, you see what I'm saying? And there is a very clear overarching plot. Now, we're not gonna talk about American Horror Story and its inconsistencies. That's a different story. That's a different story, a different video. But I'm saying it works better in some series than others. Oh my gosh! 
the, t- the amount of text messages. Should I just start over? Good Lord. Anyway, <laughs> I'm so popular. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> where was I? So that doesn't work. It takes you out of it. It's like there's, it lowers the stakes the more you dive into people's backstory. Then the backstories, none of the, the backstories are super convoluted and not satisfying. So we learned that Danny's backstory is with her fiance. And it's like, eh. And then he just disappears after we learn the backstory. It's like she magically went to therapy and she doesn't have any more regrets or trauma. And it's like, were we the therapist? We didn't know. Like, we just saw the backstory and now it's done. And then it's like, okay, now she's dating another character. And it's like, <laughs> because she's dating Jamie, now she's cured. That's not good. Because people in real life think that that's how therapy should work. That's not how therapy works. You can't just date someone new and then like, I'm good now. I'm happy now. No. Okay. And then <laughs> it just, it just, uh, and then in like episode seven or eight, we get the whole backstory of the whole place and why the house has this curse on it. The house has this curse because this woman who grew up there She's so strong-willed, and she wouldn't let a man take her house. And then it's a really convoluted plot. I love, I love a good woman empowerment plot. That's great. But like, sis, it was too much. It was really. I'm like, oh my god. It was a whole episode of just this old flashback, black and white, explaining who the woman in the water is and what what is her story. It was. I was like. I don't think we needed that. I think we could have learned that. People always say like expos. They hate exposition dumps. Like they you they literally had whole episodes that were exposition exposition dumps. Like honestly, that's my opinion. Some people love it. They're like, oh, it's such great storytelling. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. Um, and then I have your Peter Quint. Now his whole Miles who who. Miles was the little boy. Oh, I'm going to be confusing people. Peter Quint was the grown man, and he took over Miles' body. Anyway, Peter Quint was clearly a metaphor for abuse. (laughs) He, like, he abused that girl. He emotionally abused her. He grabbed her. He never, like, hauled off and slapped her across the face. But he did, you know, abuse her. Like, he trapped her. You know what it reminded me of? That movie with Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt. Because he basically tricks her. And if you watch the movie, the, the series, he tricks her into staying in Bly with him. Because he's like, pull me into your body. Let me possess your body. And we'll be together forever. I know a way we can do it. So he goes into her body and kills her. He possesses her body and walks her a into the lake walks her into the lake and drowns his girlfriend so he she'll she'll stay with him forever but i'm like you know what that reminds me of the movie with jennifer lawrence and chris pratt when he woke up and was alone and he's like you know what since my pod stopped working i don't want to be here by myself i'm gonna wake up jennifer lawrence to be my beautiful companion (laughs) these men ain't nothing i tell you that these men ain't shit. And I gotta say it. I gotta say it. Oh my gosh. And that's it. That's basically all my notes. Most of the play most of the plot. Can people think da 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 da? Um, creepy energy. Great. Okay. I don't know what they were thinking. Okay. That's it. This is a really long video. I went over all my notes. <laughs> You're probably like, really? You drew your notes? Yes. Okay. That's it. That's all my thoughts on Blind Manor. It was fine. Uh, four phone calls and two text messages later, <laughs> the video is done. Like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs>